so here we are outside the campground gates. July was surprisingly sunny and warm. Sweat was running down the faces of the prisoners. The convoy with dogs was hurrying. The gaunt prisoners had an incredibly hard time walking. They traversed the cobblestone streets of the city, entered the suburbs, and finally made their way outside the city. Women prisoners of war, and there were 30 of them. Doctors, nurses, orderlies, cooks, were built separately and squeezed somewhere in the middle of the column. They walked three, four kilometres. Suddenly, on the order of the convoy officer, they stopped the whole column and took the women out of it. Two convoy guards, together with a German interpreter and an officer, took this group of female prisoners of war to a small grove not far from the farm. We became worried. What do they want to do with them? Shoot them? After 10, 15 minutes, the command was given to continue moving and we set off again. A few minutes later, the officer, the escort and the interpreter returned. Through the interpreter, we found out that allegedly the women were released to the nearest farm. But the officer had previously taken their word that they would not fight against the Germans again. We did not hear any shots, so we could not shoot them. The situation was not the same. An artillery cannonade was clearly heard from the west and southwest. The convoyers were in a great hurry to rush the column. They were helped by sheepdogs. Where did the Germans get so many specially trained dogs? During two or three days of our journey, we could hear the rumblings of the approaching front. We had the impression that both the Germans and we were in some kind of a semi-environment, a semi-ring. We wandered westward, under the escort of guards with a pack of specially trained dogs, weary, exhausted, sick and wounded, knocking and raising dust with wooden blocks, slaves of the Third Reich, doomed to death. The stragglers, who could not go any further, were shot, and the convoyer was calmly finishing his sandwich after the execution. There was absolutely no emotion on his face. Empty tin-coloured eyes. He walks and chews, holding a machine gun at the ready. Shots are often heard from behind the column. They are killing the exhausted, the stragglers. They destroy them, though behind the column of the doomed there are a dozen half-empty trucks with a shift and a reserve of the same guards' palaces. Clear, sunny weather changed to cloudy, rainy. We travelled through the westernmost regions of Ukraine. For the night we were driven into large, empty collective farm cattle yards. A little dawn breaks, and again the formation, another march. Tired and hungry, in rainy weather we marched hard and slowly. We entered the territory of Poland. The bread given out by the dry rations had long ago run out. We drank mostly from roadside ditches. On one of the highways we saw a rather large column of German soldiers mixed with Cossack volunteer units. Convoys shouted at the column of prisoners of war to the side to let the Germans and Cossacks with their wagons with equipment through. The soldiers were drunk. There was a traffic jam on the road, drunken voices in German and Russian. Somewhere they began to fight, swearing and matey. Two Cossacks come staggering up to a German field officer. One of them yells, Field Febel, why did you hit me? The decomposition of the troops was evident. It was the panic of the retreating enemy. During the further movement of the column of prisoners of war, we noticed that many farms and villages were packed with retreating German military units. On separate accumulations of German troops, our aviation made strikes. Every day to go in a column became more and more difficult. Some prisoners could not stand such a march and fell down. Under the threat of the muzzle of an automatic rifle, they get up again by themselves or with the help of comrades and march again. Neighbours in the column continue to support them under their arms. Some, completely exhausted, fall right on the road and do not get up, although they are still alive. These unfortunate people do not react to the threat of a machine gun because they cannot get up, let alone walk. In the farms, Ukrainian women asked the officer of the convoy to take such unfortunate people to their hut. The officer did not give his booty to them. The convoy officers dragged such doomed people behind the yard of the nearest hut or a ditch. Sometimes shots were fired and sometimes not. It is not known what happened to them. Perhaps they were bayoneted. 
It was getting harder and harder to walk. There was not enough air to breathe. Suddenly I also fell down and was no longer able to get up, although my brain was frantically prompting, Get up! Get up! Otherwise, death! But I was saved probably by a bandage on my sleeve with a red cross. The escort comes up and yells, Doctor! Ofstein! Doctor! Stand up! Two prisoners of war came up, picked me up and dragged me. They dragged me because my legs couldn't move on their own. But the thought worked clearly. Go! Go! After a few minutes I began to move my legs, but my comrades were still helping me to walk, supporting me under their arms. Suddenly the column stopped. An hour's rest was announced. Here I finally caught my breath. The unexpected stop had saved my life and the lives of many other prisoners of war. For the fourth time in captivity, death looked me in the eye at a very close distance. The first time was in the Konstantinovsky camp, when I was sick with typhus. The second time during the evacuation from the Dnepropetrovsk camp, during an unsuccessful escape attempt. The third time in the Vinitsa prisoner of war camp when I was sick with dysentery. And now the fourth time. Boney let go. For how long? So day after day the column, like a ghost, passed countless farms, villages, towns and cities, up to the eastern border of Germany. Only by the Ukrainian and Polish towns separately preserved in my memory, I can reconstruct the hard, exhausting way of our column. Lvov, Gorodok, Peremyshel, Czestochow, the rest of the cities and even smaller settlements have long ago been erased from my memory. And we went not in a straight line, but in zigzags, bypasses. The speed of movement was uneven. We moved very slowly, stopping every 40-50 minutes. Then the Germans forced us to make a quick march. On the fourth or fifth day of the way we met low mountains. Someone said that they were spurs of the Carpathians. It was especially hard to cross them. One climbed up, breathing heavily, with a pounding in the temples, and then descended again. Around some hills the column made a circular movement on the principle of screw. This went on several times. Maybe in peacetime the Carpathians are really beautiful, but for us they were cursed. Short stops did not give us a chance to rest, it was raining incessantly. Torn clothes got wet, it was getting cold, especially in the high, mountainous areas. Somehow, before reaching Chestershoa, the column was ordered to stop. It was in the evening, it was pouring fine rain, exactly passed through a sieve. It turned out that we would spend the night in the open air. Not far from the halted column, about 500 metres away, there was a manor house, a beautiful white two-storied brick house surrounded by pyramidal poplars and a garden. Around the house all sorts of outbuildings. From the house a well-dressed beautiful woman came up to the escort, a middle-aged soldier, and asked in German, Where can I find Mr. Officer? Mr. Baron is just next door, the machine gunner replies. He was indeed about 15 metres away from us. While she was walking towards the officer I asked the escort, Wer ist sie? Who is she? Polnische Gutsbesitzerin. Polish landlady. As soon as she approached the officer in charge of the convoy, my ears perked up. She also offers him in German, Mr. Baron, if you will stay with the prisoners for the night, I invite you together with your officers, there were four or five of them in all, to spend the night at my house. A bath of warm water and a good dinner with decent wines will be prepared for you. The escorts who are off duty can warm up and rest in the warm utility room. The baron in the rank of major gladly replied, Thank you, honourable madam. We will definitely come. Thank you very much. The Polish landlady did not ask the German about the prisoners, nor did she offer to take them under the roof of the numerous barns. Bastard, it was boiling in my chest. If I had had a machine gun in my hands, I would have killed not the German officer, but her. We were outraged, not by the fact that she invited the Baron into the house, that was her business, but by the fact that she was indifferent to the fate of the exhausted, hungry, half-dead Soviet prisoners of war. The Baron left for the whole night, and the rest of the officers took turns leaving for an hour and a half. We, on the other hand, huddled together under guard and stayed out in the rain until morning. 
early in the morning again barking harsh shouts and profanity. Orf stayen, entretien, loss, donna wind. Stand up, form up, forward, forward, forward. Thunderbolt you. We were also convinced that many Germans swear splendidly in two or three story Russian mat. We often heard, Jopt voyumat. Whether they understood the meaning is unknown. In the first days of August 1944, our column of tired and exhausted Soviet prisoners of war entered the enemy's land. It was the easternmost part of Germany, the land of the enemy. Nazi Germany, what is it like? What does it represent? There was a kind of curiosity. We wandered slowly. For some reason, the convoyers don't seem to be in a hurry. Villages, farms, settlements, good brick buildings covered with tiles, and none under an iron roof. Houses built for centuries, but how monotonous they are, similar to each other, like twins. So are the outbuildings. All the buildings are intact, not destroyed, no signs of bombing. There has been no real war here yet. The dreary look of rural settlements is slightly brightened up by the Gothic-style kirshas. The streets are clean and tidy. On the way of the column there are small groves, parks and well-maintained ponds. Trees are thoroughly cleaned, trimmed, levelled and licked. This is not the Bryansk forest in Belarus. Roads and paths, streets and alleys are asphalted. Yes, there was no war here, but soon there will be. There are quite a few passers-by. They say hello to the guards. Morgen, guten Morgen. They answer them softly and mutually. Many bicycles, on them both old and young. Each bicycle carries a basket, suitcase or other cargo. The composition of passers-by also attracted attention. They are mostly old men, old women and children. There are no young, middle-aged or even relatively elderly men. This is as it should be. As a result of total mobilizations, they have all been swallowed up by the Moloch of war unleashed by the Mad Führer. There are many disabled people, without an arm, without a leg, in wheelchairs. We look into the eyes of passers-by. What do they express? Nothing, eyes like eyes, thinking, indifferent, sometimes empty, sometimes sad, sometimes happy. Eyes like any people in the world. After the war, I had to read and hear a lot about the attitude of the German civilian population to Soviet prisoners of war. Most authors claim that in 1941, 1943, the German population, especially young people, not only looked at the Soviet PRBUs with hatred, but also pelted them with stones, rotten eggs, logs, insulted them. That was how it was then in reality. And now? Why today they look at us with different eyes and do not allow any attacks against us? The fact is that it was already August 1944, and ordinary Germans began to think more and more about the course and outcome of the war. And if our column had been driven through the same settlements in August 1941, the reaction of the population would have been more angry. But despite the outwardly calm attitude of civilians towards Us, we never saw a piece of breed, a carrot or a potato thrown at the column. Yes, this is not Ukraine. Don't wait, they won't give it to you. That was the first impression of the Germans, and it was not a pleasant one. At 7am on the outskirts of a small village, we noticed an incomprehensible action. On a small platform, girls about 15-17 years old surrounded a flag or banner of red colour with a swastika in a white circle. The flag resembled a church flag. The flag was slowly raised and lowered. The girls walked slowly around the circle and sang or said something. They were all dressed in the same uniform, white blouses and dark brown skirts. They had the same haircut. This procedure lasted about five minutes. I was puzzled. What is this balaganza? Yes. This is Hitler Mädchen, Hitler's youth paramilitary organisation for girls. Apparently, they had some kind of obligatory ritual in the morning. After another day, our column was let into some huge transit camp located in the suburbs of a city unknown to us, 70-90 kilometres from Berlin. 
this camp resembled the biblical Babylon. Prisoners of war of various nationalities, countries and peoples were herded here. Soviet prisoners of war, British, Americans, French, African blacks, Indians, Belgians, Dutch, Yugoslavs, Poles and even Italians. But some invisible force distributed the flows of prisoners of war in the camp in a strictly regular way. The British and Americans were in blocks separated from the Soviet prisoners of war by three rows of barbed wire. The French, Belgians and Dutch were also isolated. The Italian group of prisoners of war was separate from all the others. We were temporarily placed in barracks with two-tier bunks. We began to come to our senses. During this multi-day crossing, more than a dozen people died. We rested a little. After a couple of days, we began to look closely at Farina's. It turned out that they received food parcels of the International Red Cross once a month. The parcels were different, but here is the usual content of the American Red Cross parcels that American prisoners of war received monthly in 1943. 22. Beef stew, one can, 340 kratons. Coffee or cocoa, one can, 113 dra. Pork stew, one can, 340 kron. Raisins, prunes, one pack, 450 fork. Liver pat, one can, 170. Chocolate, two bars. Salmon, one can, 226. Biscuit, one packet. Milk powder, one can, 450 fork. Orange, one can, 113. Olive margarine, one can, 450 fork. Cigarettes, two packs. Sugar, one pack, 226 six. Soap, two bars. Soviet prisoners of war were deprived of receiving parcels and food parcels. In spite of our complete isolation from foreign prisoners of war, we still often talked to them through the barbed wire in broken German. In any case, if we needed to communicate something important, we understood each other well. They were better informed about the situation on the fronts. The Americans, British and French treated us, Soviet prisoners of war, very well. We paid them the same. Of course, they looked much fatter than we did. Sometimes they managed to throw over the fence a piece of bread, a breadcrumb, a galette, etc. Since August 1944, the Germans began to establish some contacts with the Americans and British. For example, German soldiers off duty every evening, weather permitting, played soccer with the Americans and British. Changing times. As in other camps, the daily ration was standard. A lander and a small loaf of ersatz bread for six men. This loaf was divided with great care and precision. The most experienced of the six was assigned to cut it into equal slices, which were laid out in one rad. Then came the second stage. It was advised, from which portion to add a little less and to which to add. Then one of the six would turn away, and the other, pointing to the ration of bread, would ask, To whom? Such a careful division of bread took place in all the camps of Soviet prisoners of war, so that not a single crumb could be lost without a trace. I lived in this camp for about a week. One day the chief doctor of the sanitary unit, a Russian prisoner of war, informed us that the prisoners of war would soon be distributed among the work camps and that a doctor would be sent to each such large camp and a paramedic to the smaller ones. A list of the entire camp medical personnel reserve was in his possession and he was in charge of the distribution. The Germans did not interfere in this process. If the Germans needed a doctor or a paramedic in a work camp, they informed the head doctor. The Germans did not care whom he sent, whether it was Dr Petrov or paramedic Sidorov. As a result of the evacuation and liquidation of many camps, there were quite a lot of doctors and paramedics in the transit camp. All of them were in the reserve of the chief doctor of the sanitary unit of the Russian section of the camp. Some prisoners from the transit camp were taken for a day for temporary work. Those who got to agricultural work, harvesting, were lucky. They sometimes managed to eat fruits and vegetables in the farms, and in the evening, returning from work, they brought some more food, bread, potatoes, onions, etc., such lucky people had better food than we reservists. The nursing staff was not sent to work, and we were content with just a ration of balanda and ersatz bread. One day the head doctor, whose surname I unfortunately can no longer remember, came into our barracks, looked for me and said, Balaev, and I am your fellow countryman, also from the Gorky region. He asked me more about my place of residence, what I did before the war. Then he continued, 
Would you like me to send you as a paramedic to a small work camp near Potsdam? That's exactly the kind of worker needed there. The sick people who came from that camp say that it is not so bad there. Many of the prisoners are sent to agricultural work in nearby farms, and at night they return to the camp to the barracks. They bring some food with them, so you'll get some for yourself. But here you sit only on Balanchine. I would advise you to go. Of the two evils, the Potsdam camp is the lesser evil. Get some food there. You're very thin. Do you agree? I shrugged, but asked, and how will I be transported there? That's not your concern. In the morning, I'll report to the non-commissioned officer that a medical officer for the Potsdam camp has been selected. He'll send an escort and you'll probably take a train to the city. It's an hour and a half or three hours ride. I wondered. What should I tell him? Should I say yes? Just in case, I told him I would give him an answer in two hours. I did not give my consent at once because my stay in the camps had taught me to enter into contact with people unknown to me cautiously and cautiously, not to trust unfamiliar prisoners. Things happened. Therefore, before going to the doctor and informing him of my decision, I talked courteously with one of the orderlies about the chief doctor. His answer, good prisoner. Ask it another old teamer of the camp. The answer was about the same. And only after that I went to the chief doctor in a small compartment, which was separated from the main part of the barracks by a rough blanket, and gave my consent to leave. The next morning he called me in and told me to get ready. In twenty minutes a convoyer would come for me. Exactly twenty minutes later, with my skinny cider, a duffel bag, I appeared again in the doctor's cubbyhole. In the bag I put my overcoat, a kettle, a mug and a spoon. I had nothing else. The most valuable thing in captivity is a kettle. If you lose a kettle, you die. You have nothing to pour your food into. It was impossible to use someone else's kettle. The food was distributed at the same time, and the latecomers would not get any. At the doctor's office sat my escort, an elderly soldier about 57, 60 years old with a carbine placed between his legs. The doctor handed me over to the escort, wished me to keep myself safe and not to get into any trouble. The escort stood up, put the carbine on his shoulder, and we set off. We walked about a kilometre and a half to the railway station. The old man could understand a little Russian. I asked him how he knew many Russian words. And while we were walking to the station, he, where in Russian, where in German, told me the following about himself. He comes from Potsdam has a small barbershop in which two French prisoners of war are now working. His wife runs the barbershop while he is in the army. In World War I, he was a prisoner of war for three years with the Russians. He especially noted that the villagers treated the German prisoners decently, did not scold, did not beat them, and were well fed. Chowder und, porridge odor, schi und, potatoes viel bro, alles gut, chowder and porridge, or chives and potatoes, lots of bread, it was all good. It was a warm, sunny August day. We passed small farms with identical strong buildings. We reached the station, and the escort took me into the car of an ordinary passenger train. It was the first time I was travelling in a foreign passenger train. The carriage was divided into sections by thin, low partitions, there are no sleeping places, because Germans do not have long-distance passenger trains, only seats, and the train is not like ours. There are five to six small cars attached to a small locomotive. There are not many people in the car, mostly grandmothers and children. The convoyer shows me the seat next to him. He sits down with his carbine between his legs. I sit down too. Opposite us sits a boy of about six or seven with his grandmother, who is knitting a sock. He talks to the guard and looks at me curiously, furtively. The little boy stares at me without shyness. Probably his elders told him that Russians are like bears, hairy and with horns on their heads. But here sits an ordinary man, though thin and in decayed, burned out clothes. I listen to the conversation between the escort and an elderly woman, who, without ceasing, is working rapidly with the fingers of both hands. The conversation is soft. Versteht Deutsch? Wohin fahren? Wer ist hier? Ja. Wer ist unter Arzt? Fahren nach Potsdam? 
Arbeitslager. Does he understand German? Where are you going? Who is he? Yes, he understands. He's a junior doctor. We are going to Potsdam to a work camp. I pretended not to listen to the conversation and not to understand them. There are few passengers in the carriage and almost all of them are women and children. Hunched over sit a few invalids, a sign of the hot breath of war. Almost all the women passengers are working. They talk and work, mostly knitting socks, scarves, gloves, a hard-working nation if they're so careful with their free time. But there's no fun in the carriage. You rarely even see a smile. That's understandable. A rare German family probably hasn't received a funeral. Rare elderly men opened the newspapers they had brought on the road. The woman sitting opposite me asked one man for a newspaper and unfolded it. I discreetly glanced at her. Front page. Lots of black boxes with crosses. I didn't realise what they were at first. Then I realised they were obituaries of the dead at the front. The Germans are eagerly reading. Died. 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 Died for the glory of the Führer. Well, you unleashed the war, not you personally, but you contributed to the rise to power of the Nazis. You supported the Führer. You will have to experience the bitterness of retribution. Take what you've earned. With my mind, I understand that the passengers of this car may have nothing to do with unleashing the war, but with my heart, I cannot accept it. Everyone, old and young, decently dressed. Late summer landscapes are flying by outside the window. Harvesting is going on. Rye is being mowed. Vegetables are being removed from the vegetable gardens. I notice that every square metre of vegetable garden area is used for its intended purpose. There are no weeds in vegetable gardens and orchards. Everything is well groomed. You can't deny the German peasants' diligence and neatness. And to say, vegetable gardens and orchards are too small, tiny. It is impossible to compare them with the vast fields of Russia. They are incommensurable concepts. The same can be said about local forests. If we, in Russia, meet a forest, this forest, as a rule, extends for tens of kilometres. It is not a trimmed grove. And what to speak about the famous Siberian tiger, which has the size of thousands of kilometres. Mostly old men, old women and children work in the fields and vegetable gardens. These are the results of total mobilisation. There are gardens, groves, forests, numerous chimneys of factories, plants and other industrial enterprises. The train is dragging slowly, like a turtle. I look at the boy and mentally ask myself a question. What will you be, little boy, when you grow up, when the war is over? An executioner of other nations or an honest, hard-working German? In the meantime, he scrutinises me from head to toe. Probably the first time he sees a living Russian. I thought about it and lowered my head. Suddenly I hear some rustling from all sides. I lifted my head and I don't understand anything. Where are these sounds coming from? It turned out that all the Germans sitting in the car, minute by minute, almost synchronously, began to unfold knots, newspapers, boxes. They took out sandwiches, bottles. They ate, chomped. The brunch started all over Germany. I got hungry drooling. Instantly there was irritation and anger. Don't wait, Russian prisoner. No one will give you anything here. This is not Ukraine, a foreign nation. And it's not that Germans are frugal people, that all products among the civilian population are distributed strictly on cards, but probably that the Germans sitting in the carriage were simply afraid to do so. The Gestapo network of espionage and denunciations kept German citizens in fear. They were just afraid of each other. You helped a Soviet prisoner of war. Not only is that unpatriotic, but it's treason against the Reich. Finally, after a two-hour drive, we arrive at the bustling train station. As in all train stations of the world and here rushing many-faced and many-voiced people, few people pay attention to us. Several times the escort was asked by civilians where he was taking a Soviet prisoner of war. He answered that he was escorting me to the Potsdam camp and there were no more questions. We entered the Berlin subway. An ancient subway, gas lighting, small stations darkened by time. 
I compare it with the Moscow subway where I was in 1937, and the comparison is clearly not in favour of the Berlin subway. There is a strange feeling that I found myself during the war in the suburbs of the capital of Nazi Germany. Hardly any of the Russians at that time, on the verge of the collapse of the Reich, were here. It was like a fantasy movie where times and events intermingled. I, a prisoner of war, in a Soviet officer's uniform with an escort, walked past civilians, Wehrmacht soldiers, SS men. Two, a Soviet prisoner of war and a German elderly infantry soldier. I never would have thought that one day I would have to stomp through the streets of the suburbs of the Nazi capital, and even in such a capacity, walking through the streets of Potsdam, beautiful, well-kept city, palaces, cathedrals, town hall, mansions, parks and squares. The escort, apparently, noticed my observation and informs me. The city of Potsdam is comparable in beauty to Versailles. Maybe he is right. I've never been to Versailles. In fact, the city is nice and almost not destroyed by aviation. Slowly we continue our march through the streets and alleys of the city. Of course it was possible to run away from the escort, but what would be the use and the point? Where would I hide in the centre of Germany, in a hostile country, in a Soviet military uniform with SU branded on the back? I was a black sheep in this world, hostile to me. My guard also understood this, so he carried his carbine on his shoulder and did not particularly follow me. In the meantime, the guard led me into a small, narrow street with very modest houses and cottages. He brings me to one of them and says softly, Halt! Das ist mein Haus! Wait, that's my house? That's it. So he brought me to his house. Apparently that's why they sent him, a Potsdam resident, to escort me. He opens a door. We go through a small lighted corridor. We open a second door and enter a tiny barber shop with two chairs. The barbers, two French prisoners of war, nodded their heads and said hello to the owner and smiled at me. I answered them in the same way. In one of the chairs sat an old man who was being shaved. When he came out, the master closed the inner door with a key, told him to wait here with words and signs and went into the next room. The Frenchman immediately invited me to sit down in one of the chairs. They cut my hair and shaved me. One of the Frenchmen gave me a piece of bread of 150 grams wrapped in paper. I thanked him and instantly ate the bread. Since I did not understand French and the French in Russian, the conversation between us took place in not particularly literate German. We found out from each other what, from where, when and how we were captured. In particular, I found out that the French have been working in this barbershop for the fourth year, and that the owner of this establishment, i.e. my convoyer's wife, is in charge of them. She also feeds them, and they live in one of the small rooms. They have free access to the city, but they have to check in with the local policeman every day. These, it turns out, are all the conditions of their stay in captivity. When I asked them how their mistress feeds them, they said that it is fine, but modest, because they receive absolutely everything on cards, including salt, dill and mustard. The hostess has her own tiny vegetable garden and it is a great help to her. She never yells or hurts them. About an hour later this Frau comes in with a plate and a spoon in her hands. She moves a small table, puts the plate and spoon on it, and with words and signs invites me to eat. I stood up, nodded my head to let him know that I understood, and looked at my hands. The obliging Frenchman opened the faucet in the sink and I washed my hands. I poured some potato soup into my plate, seasoned with fried onions and vegetable oil. Quickly this soup was eaten, there was no bread. Five minutes later she brought two potato pancakes with a little fried flour, and I ate them all quickly. How delicious the first and second seemed to me then. The Frau comes in again to clear the dishes from the table and asks, Schmeckt? Is it good? I answered in the affirmative, stood up, thanked her with a weak note of my head so as not to lose in my dignity. Someone may ask, why in the train car nobody guessed to offer me something to eat, but here they suddenly fed a prisoner? I have already given the answer earlier. 
There were simply no prying eyes and ears in the barbershop, and not all Germans were fascists. I thought to myself that an ordinary German citizen eats very modestly. Two and a half hours after coming to the barbershop, the owner came out of a side room with a carbine. I said goodbye to the Frenchman, and we walked again through the streets of the town. On one of them, the convoyer stopped me and said, Guck mal. Look, look. On a broad oil-painted board, a signpost, was an inscription in German and Russian, Russische Kolonien, Russian colony. So that's it. That's why the convoyer stopped me here. In front of me was a long row of wooden houses. They were all on stone foundations with mezzanines and tile roofs. The houses were on both sides of the street. The walls were chopped from thick pine logs. The rows of houses were as straight as a string. It was obvious that the houses had been built a long time ago. It was noticeable by the thoroughly darkened logs. Then, for some reason, I did not find out the nature of this street, when, by whom, and for whom it was built. We stood for a couple of minutes and went on. Only much later did I learn that the Russian Emperor Alexander the Ferns gave the Prussian king a brass band, a company of musicians. A Russian-style settlement was built for them. As far as I know, nowadays this Russian settlement in Germany is called Russian Village. More information, a house in Alexandrovka, a Russian village near Potsdam. The author writes about this village in his memoirs. A few hundred metres from this village there was a prisoner of war camp. We approach the camp. At the gate is approaching a field officer, the commandant of the work camp, where exclusively Soviet prisoners of war. The escort reports to him and hands him some paper, apparently my record card. We enter a small wooden barrack-type room. This is the commandant's office building. A desk, three stools, a telephone, a washstand with a basin. The building is located in the immediate vicinity of the camp. Nearby is another wooden barrack, possibly a guardhouse and a soldier's barracks. The field officer, like the escort, in years, in a green army uniform, asked me a single question. Where are you from? Where were you born? Bitter Gebit, followed the answer. A camp escort arrived and took me to the campgrounds. All the barracks were brick, one story of the same type. The camp was about 800, 900 metres away from the city. He took me into one of the barracks. It was already evening, and the working shift of prisoners of war had already returned from work. I said hello. The reply was, Hello, doctor. They saw my white armband with a red cross on my sleeve and thought I was a doctor. I had to correct them. Guys, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a military field officer. Well, still a doctor. Several voices resounded. There was no need to object, nor was there any point. The two-storey wooden bunks were placed almost next to each other. I was shown a free place on the lower bunks. I lay down a little, I thought about it. A new stage in my life was beginning, if you can call such an existence life. What does the future hold for me and these guys? How will our future fate turn out? The escort left. The guys, seeing my condition, came up to me. Doctor, don't get upset, though we are fed badly, but we bring something from work, especially potatoes and bulb, we'll share. We asked each other questions, got acquainted. The age of the prisoners varied, both young and middle-aged, Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Tatars. While I was resting a bit, they had already boiled potatoes in pots and cauldrons. They'd brought them from work. Doctor, let's have dinner with us. We ate. Potatoes are so tasty compared to the tiresome camp food. The German guards began checking for prisoners of war at 9.30 in the evening. In each barracks there was a line-up of prisoners in the presence of a field officer and one soldier. They count them, close and lock the door with a big weighty lock on the outside. The windows have thick metal bars. Before the formation for the night in the barracks, prisoners bring the infamous parashah. All night long, a single bulb shines dimly at the ceiling, embedded in a netted metal lampshade. The first night in the new place, I couldn't sleep for a long time. Snoring, moaning, incoherent, mumbling in his sleep, stale air. 
There were 26 people in the barracks, and the room was small. From time to time in the windows of the barracks gets a bright light of searchlights, which are on guard towers, and periodically comb the territory of the camp. At six o'clock in the morning, the locks rattle. Open and immediately the command, Aufstehen, wake up. We stood up and waited. From each barracks to the kitchen goes one for ersatz bread, two with a can for surrogate coffee or tea, a dark liquid sweetened with saccharine. We divide the bread according to the principle of to whom. Half an hour later, line up for work. Several work teams, but the work is different. The prisoners of my barracks for several months are taken for agricultural work in the nearest farm to one rich peasant, Grossbauer, or simply Bauer. But this Bauer, as I was told, did not offend our brother prisoner in any way. He made him work to the best of his ability and provided him with food after work. He gave out potatoes, onions, cucumbers, even garlic. Other work teams were sent for reconstruction work after bombings, construction of some objects, economic works. To each column going to work, escorts with carbines were assigned. There were no automatic rifles, I noticed that. In the morning all the prisoners were dispersed to work, and I was left alone. During the day the barracks were not locked by the Germans. I began to walk around the camp. Its territory is relatively small, and there are about 600 prisoners of war in the camp. Uncertain for me in the camp is the range of my medical duties and the availability of medical preparations and facilities. What to do in the field of medicine, I assumed, but what means and possibilities I would have, this was still unknown to me. However, on the eve of my departure from the transit camp, the chief physician told me that he had sent two dozen aspirin tablets, some calcex, pyramidon, tannin and bandages, to the Potsdam camp. Before my shipment, the head doctor also asked me to remember the following. The commandant of a work camp has an interest in keeping his prisoners of war healthy and able to work. In case one of the POWs becomes seriously ill, he will try to get rid of him by sending him back to the distribution camp. In his place, a healthy POW would be sent to the work camp. But the sent sick man would find himself in a most dire situation. Whereas before his nutrition was supplemented with vegetables from the farms, in the distribution camp there would be nothing but mockery and humiliation. That's why, said the head doctor, a lot will depend on you. Do everything you can to convince the commandant of the patient's speedy recovery and the undesirability of sending him to the distribution camp. As I walked around the campgrounds between the barracks, I recalled the instructions and advice of my senior medical comrade in rank and age. But so far I had a vague idea of my duties. Apparently the matter would become clearer the next day. Unobtrusively, I observed the guards. At the corners of the camp territory there are towers, guards with carbines on them. From tower to tower along the barbed wire slowly walk German soldiers, also with carbines. Thus, unlike in the stalags, in the work camp, the Germans are guarded not with machine guns, but with carbines. Dogs are also absent. There is no current running through the wire. Most of the guards are elderly Germans. From all these observations, I concluded that the guards in this work camp were somewhat weakened. The next day, the field fleeble explained to me my duties. Every morning, I must thoroughly clean the barracks room. Medical care was to be given only as needed. He further explained that the first aid kit with the minimum of medicines was in the service barracks outside the camp, that is, behind the barbed wire. Hence, for every trifling pill or bandage I, together with the victim and the escort, must leave the camp, go to the service barrack, enter it and ask the field officer for this and that. If he authorises it, you can take it. And if he does not allow it, then you have to go back to the camp. In case of a more serious illness, the escort must take the sick prisoner of war and me to some garrison sanitary unit, which is located a kilometre and a half or two kilometres away from the camp in the town of Potsdam. He did not explain what this garrison sanitary unit was. Several days passed. Every evening, columns of prisoners came to their barracks. They often brought potatoes, carrots, onions and sometimes garlic from agricultural work. 
In my barracks, a small stove was heated in the evening and dinner was cooked. They brought firewood with them from work. One day I said to them, Guys, I'm eating you a little, eating the food you brought. No way, Doctor. What kind of conversation can there be? Why do you have to sit alone on one meal? Nice guys. Even though I explained my military rank to them, they all kept calling me Doctor, or by my name. In age, they were the same age as me or a little older, except for three or four elderly prisoners. After another day of work, one POW came into the camp with both hands wounded. I was summoned by the escort outside the camp gate, and I went with him to the administration building. The field officer pointed to the first aid kit and went about his business. He was writing something at his desk. The comrade's wounds were not serious, not dangerous. The first aid kit had absorbent cotton, bandages, iodine tincture, and even a solution of Rivenol, the sterility of which I doubted. All trophy, that is, ours. I made a treatment and applied a bandage. While working, I discreetly examined the interior of the room. On one of the walls is a huge and very detailed map of the European part of the USSR, in German. I approached it. The map was so detailed that on it I even found my native village Azrapino. Immediately, I felt sad. On the other wall were various orders and instructions concerning the regime, security and treatment of Soviet prisoners of war. I paid special attention to these orders, believing that next time it would be necessary to familiarise myself with them in more detail, or at least to understand their meaning. Soon, I heard the voice of the escort. Calm? Calm? Thus I had to visit this barracks several times, as a result of which I thoroughly understood the meaning of the orders about Soviet prisoners of war. The essence of them was as follows. All the papers bore the inscription, Supreme Command of the German Armed Forces. It was noted everywhere that a Soviet prisoner of war must necessarily be accompanied by an armed escort. His weapon must always be in readiness. POWs must have wooden blocks on their feet. It was obligatory to brand the clothes of prisoners with indelible paint. Under no circumstances were the prisoners allowed to have contact with the civilian German population, as well as with the population of the occupied areas. Convoys and prisoners were forbidden to talk, except in special cases connected with giving instructions at work. At the slightest breach of order and behaviour, it was prescribed to beat a prisoner with sticks or truncheons. A list of violations and the number of blows for each offence was given. Escape was punishable by firing squad or concentration camp. In work camps, it was ordered to see to it that prisoners of war did not rest. Each POW's card must have his fingerprints on it, made with black, indelible paint. No contact between Soviet POWs and POWs of other countries was allowed. On German territory, physiological contact between a Soviet prisoner of war and German women was never allowed. For violation, the prisoner of war was shot, and so on and so forth. Under all orders and instructions, the same signature, Field Marshal Keitel. This is who, it turns out, was the main torturer of Soviet prisoners of war. I repeat that such cruel orders and instructions concerned only Soviet prisoners of war. Englishmen, Americans, Frenchmen, Negroes and so on were in the conditions of Potsdam at that time, semi reconvoyed Such a cruel system of guarding and abuse did not apply to them. I began to look at the guards inside the camp, i.e. those German soldiers who entered the camp and did not stand on the towers. They had no weapons except bayonet knives. I paid attention to a 25 to 28 year old German soldier named Richard. The prisoners of war told me the following. He is the son of a rich peasant. His father had been a prisoner of war in World War I with the Russians, about whom he spoke well. That's why Richard received an order from his father, not to offend Russian prisoners, and especially not to raise his hands on them. And this order was strictly followed by his son. Another soldier, Hans, was also young but scolded and beat us desperately. A pupil of the Hitler Youth, an ardent Nazi, in addition, he clearly lacked in the head. Soon he was sent to the front for some reason. 
The first decade of October 1944. Great weather, many clear sunny days. It was a golden autumn, reminiscent of our central Russian autumn. But there were a lot of chestnuts and other non-Russian trees. Involuntary comparisons, sadness, incredible longing. The nature of the first half of the fall is almost ours. Almost, but not ours. The distinctive peculiarities catch the eye. Cleaned up trees and bushes, alien land, alien people. Memories stir again. My unit and division, I must think, are at war. And me? Why am I hanging around here? I wasn't taken prisoner by choice, that's true. But somehow, some prisoners managed to escape from captivity. What did the captured officers from Sevastopol teach me? Why couldn't I escape? Why didn't I use every opportunity in my native Ukraine? There the population would have been able to hide me and transport me to the right place. Nikolshin managed to get out of the Dnepropetrovsk camp. And me? Why am I being driven like a sheep further and further to the west and driven to Germany itself? All these thoughts were weighing on me and depressing me. In my spare time, I was going through all this. How could I break the hateful chains of captivity? Suppose that I managed to escape from the camp, get to Potsdam, and then what? Any old German woman would turn me into the Gestapo or the police. So days went by under these agonizing worries and reflections. Field Feeble, the commandant of the labor camp. Who is he? Cautiously, I began to ask the prisoners about him. They gave quite an exhaustive answer. A peasant, his family lives in a farm near Potsdam. He has six children. In our terms, that's a lot. He doesn't behave well with Soviet prisoners of war. Comrades told us that at the beginning of 1944, he took away from the prisoners three times all the vegetables they brought from work. As a result, they were hungry for a long time. He used his car to take all the vegetables taken away to his home. Did he beat the prisoners? No, he did not, but he scolded them severely. Many teams of prisoners were sent to the city to remove the rubble, the result of bombing of Potsdam by the Anglo-American bomber aviation. It was hard and exhausting work. Allied aviation in the late fall and winter of 1944-45, as well as in March and April 1945, the city was bombed very intensively. In the early spring of 1945, Soviet aviation also carried out intensive bombing strikes on the city's military facilities and troop concentrations. It is fair to say that during the raids, not only on the territory of the camp, but even near it, not a single Soviet or Allied bomb fell. One day, teams of prisoners who were working to remove rubble in the city returned to the camp sullen and depressed. I asked them what was wrong. One of the prisoners told me a frightening picture. They were removing the rubble of residential buildings after an American air raid. The inhabitants were pulled out from under the rubble. The living, the dead and the wounded, old men and women, women and children. A terrible and depressing picture. One does not even want to have dinner after such work. We know how cruelly the Germans destroyed our towns and villages, destroyed the civilian population, but those were fascists in black and green uniforms. And we have no grudge against these victims, tormented old men, women and especially children. They are not to blame for the atrocities of fascism on our land, but there is nothing we can do about it. Such are the costs of the aggressive war of conquest of German fascism towards its own people. Such is the other side of the coin of a war that we did not start. Then the prisoners of war told about their work in the city. The bombing of Potsdam by the Allied Air Force destroyed many of Potsdam's residential buildings. People remained in basements under the rubble of collapsed houses. Where the basement windows were blocked with stones, people suffocated. Where possible, they broke through the walls to bring in fresh air. Many were pulled out wounded, many already dead. Some survivors walked aimlessly through the ruins, muttering something. Prisoners of war, civilians and German soldiers worked to save the inhabitants of the city. After the dismantling of the rubble was completed, the inhabitants of the surviving houses began to bring bread to the prisoners. With shaking hands, not yet recovered, they handed it to their deliverers with the words, Danke, Danke. Thank you, thank you. 
During the bombardment of the city at night, German soldiers with an additional escort took all the prisoners out of the barracks and into deep trenches they had dug. The prisoners were driven into these trenches and guarded heavily. We had the impression that all this was done not to save the lives of the prisoners, but to prevent the prisoners from escaping from the barracks during bombing raids. Our work team once met two French prisoners of war in the city at work. It turned out that during air raids the German command allowed American, English and French prisoners of war to leave the territory of the camps and go to the field or to the nearest farms. After the bombing was over, they would return again. This permission was given only to Allied Poos. Soviet ones were not. At the end of November, one prisoner from our barracks fell seriously ill. Severe cough, fever, suspected acute bronchitis or pneumonia. I reported it to the guard, the guard reported it to the paramedic. A captured paramedic had no right to give a sick man a day's leave from work. In this case, the paramedic sent the sick man and me with the escort to the city to a small garrison sanitary unit, which was located one and a half kilometres away from the camp. A German military doctor admitted Germans, soldiers and civilians first. We were ordered to wait in the common room. I sat down on a bench with the sick man and the escort. About ten minutes passed. The front door opens and two American captured soldiers and one Englishman enter. The sick men. They greet each other mutually. Allies, after all. They arrived at the garrison sanitary unit without any guards. The Allies sat on another bench, but next to us. Our escort went to the open door to smoke. The Americans and we wanted to make conversation, but I didn't understand English and they didn't understand Russian. I had to resort to German willy-nilly. One of them spoke decent German. He came over to me. I asked him a question that worried me. What's new on the fronts? The offensive of the troops of Russian generals Zhukov and Konev from Poland is directed to the central part of Germany. Our troops are advancing from the west. The hour of our liberation is near. Russian troops are beating the Germans all along the front. I admire the courage of your soldiers and officers. Most of the destroyed, defeated and captured German divisions account for the heroic Russian army. I had to correct him a little. Not generals, but Marshals Zhukov and Konev. Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, Marshal? I asked him another question. How do you know all this? We in the camp use reliable information. I did not specify what these sources were. Then the American took four cigarettes out of his pocket, gave two to the Russian patient and two to me. The patient took them, and I thanked him and refused, saying that I don't smoke. We talked about work in the civilian life. I had a very good impression of the Allied soldiers. Simple, friendly guys with an open mind. Workers, peasants, small traders, dressed in soldiers' overcoats. For myself, I noted that they do not separate the concepts of German and fascist. For them, they are all Boshi. In their concept, a German and a Nazi are one and the same. Now, 60 years after the end of the war, I remember this conversation. A simple, not too literate American soldier was absolutely correct in his reasoning about the dominant role of the Soviet army in defeating the military forces of fascism. But now, both in the West and in Russia, we often do not remember about it anymore. Two hours later, we were summoned to the doctor. I asked the escort who would receive the patient. Alte Stabarzt, came the reply. Translated into our old military ranks, this meant second rank military doctor. Quietly, I asked a clarifying question. Stabarzt of the SS? Nein, Grenadieren. According to my duty, it was necessary for me to take the sick prisoner under protection i.e. to ask the German doctor to release the sick person from all kinds of work at least for one week. Before leaving for the city, the Fieldfelder warned the escort that the doctor, if possible, should not grant the exemption. This conversation I heard. Then the sick man would be sent to the central camp, getting rid of the burden. For the sick man it was on the verge of death. 
we had to do everything possible to prevent it. After the escort knocked on the door and a voice from inside said, Kerain, come in. All three of us enter at once. Behind the desk sits an old man in his sixties with hair cut bobbed. Under his clean white robe we can see a green uniform and twisted narrow epaulettes. He allowed the patient to sit on a wooden stool. Carefully looked at me with grey intelligent eyes. I greeted him by putting the palm of my right hand on his cap as it was required by our military regulations. There followed a soft reply. Morgan. He looked at my white bandage with a red cross on the left sleeve of my tattered but relatively clean uniform and looked up at the convoyer. The response was immediate. Russischer Unterarzt, Russian junior doctor. The convoyer reported the symptoms of the sick man's illness and relayed to the doctor the field feeble's request. The old man Esculapist looks up at me again and asks, what does the Russian doctor think about the diagnosis of the patient? I took half a step forward and, in not particularly literate German, said, I think the patient has acute bronchitis and a small inflammatory process in the right lung. I could not say a large inflammation, for in that case the Stabast would immediately impose a visa to send the patient to the sanitary unit of the central camp with all the consequences for him. The old man raised his head again and reports, With the diagnosis of the Russian, I agree. Although, except for measuring the temperature, he did not perform any methods of research on the patient. He simply did not want to, did not consider it necessary to do so. The convoyer again reminds me of the field officer's request. The doctor asks me again, What's your opinion? I think there's no need to send him away. His inflammatory centre is small. We'll treat it in the camp as an outpatient. And then, you know, Herr Stabast, that the food in the central camp is bad, only Balanda. And here, in the work camp, his comrades will support him a little. I ask that he be released from work for ten days. Gut, followed the old man's reply. I gave him a work release for eight days. He ordered the escort to give it to the field officer in the camp. He asked me where I was from, how old I was, how long I had been a prisoner. He looked at my gaunt face and said quietly, I, Gefangenschaft ist Gefangenschaft? Yes, captivity is captivity. I again put my palm to the pilot and all three of us went out. I'm happy for the sick man, a victory after all. A small victory, but a victory. The German doctor agreed with my arguments. Apparently he also liked that I spoke to him politely and in German. And then... Why should I have been rude in my position to an old man without weapons who was almost three times my age, and he didn't behave like a Nazi either? Field Feeble's scheme failed, but I understood perfectly well how he would meet me. He'd scold me, but he'd hardly beat me up. It's not those times. We are approaching the service barracks of the camp. The escort reports everything in detail to the lieutenant. He looked at me angrily, with great hatred waved his hand, and we were let through the camp gates together with the sick man. And indeed, a little, though not specialised, but still treatment and relative peace plus the help of barrack mates helped the patient. In a week he began to feel tolerably well. Winter came. It was nothing like our Russian winter. Winter in Potsdam, as in the whole of Middle Germany, is exceptionally mild. It cannot even be called winter. A very thin layer of loose snow falls, then it rains. Instead of snow, there is mud. Sometimes very slight frosts of one, two degrees. At the end of March 1945, in the evening after work, the field officer ordered to build all prisoners of war on the camp square. In front of the line stood a young interpreter, also from the POWs, who spoke a little German. He, like everyone else, worked at various jobs. The field officer said, those who want to fight against Bolshevism step forward three paces. Those who wish to do so will be enrolled in the Russian Liberation Army. No one moved from his place, and a chuckle went through the ranks of the prisoners. Even the field feeble himself smiled and ordered to disband the prisoners. While people were going to the barracks, I heard several times the words, he found fools. 
Apparently, he received an order from above to carry out such work with prisoners of war, and he carried it out for the sake of appearances. The sensible German officers by that time had no hope not only for Vlasov's, but also for their own German armed forces. In the first days of April, during the bombardment of the city's military facilities by anti-aircraft artillery, our airplane was shot down. The wounded pilot parachuted down on the outskirts of Potsdam and was taken prisoner. Early the next morning he was brought under escort to our camp. I was urgently summoned to give the wounded man first aid. I was brought to the service barrack. There was a pilot, in the rank of senior lieutenant, sitting on a stool. I saluted him, putting my palm to his cap. He answered me with a nod of his head. Around him stood two field officers. There was a change of camp commandants and one guard with a carbine. The Germans withdrew a little and I started dressing him. He was wounded in the leg below the knee. The pilot looked a little confused. He was still unable to realise how he had fallen into enemy hands and where he had been led. Leaning over to clean the wound, I quietly explained to him, You have been brought to a work camp for Soviet prisoners of war. It's next door behind the wire. And this is the office of the camp commandant. I am a prisoner of war. The Germans around us do not understand anything in Russian. The wounds turned out to be not dangerous and shallow. The leg bone was not hit. The pilot sighed heavily. It's a shame to be taken prisoner at the end of the war. And how are things at the front? You yourself must realise that excellent. Successfully beat them. After treating and dressing his wounds, I tell him, you'll probably be put in this camp for the time being and then sent to the central camp. Don't be afraid of the prisoners in the camp. They are all our guys. Are you hungry? Yes, came the answer. We'll think of something in the camp. The news flew lightning fast through the camp. A wounded Russian pilot was delivered. They brought him to the camp. Dozens of prisoners ran from different barracks. Who holds in his hands a piece of bread? Who? Boiled potatoes? Who? Onions. But the guards do not let the prisoners near the pilot. They took him into one of the empty small brick barracks with unglazed but barred windows and locked him up. Modest food wrapped in paper flew through the barrack windows. Convoys swearing, yelling. All the prisoners were soon thrown out for formation, then to work. In the afternoon, the guards were removed from the barracks. The Germans waved their hand. Anyway, it was impossible to eliminate contacts of prisoners with the pilot. The next day, early in the morning, he was taken to the central stalag. During my last trip to the city with a guard and a sick man to the garrison sanitary unit, I noticed a striking change in the life of the city. It was at the end of April. Our troops were already a few dozen kilometres away from Potsdam. Potsdam was stuffed with troops. The streets passed formed from the population of the Volkssturm detachments. With Faust patrons were columns of old men and very young boys of 14 to 15 years old. The city was intensively preparing for defence. Anti-aircraft guns stood in parks and squares. Trenches and trenches were dug between houses. All the able-bodied population remaining in the city was working. Windows of the lower floors and cellars were covered with sandbags. On some houses, huge posters with large inscriptions, Shh! Careful! Don't spill secrets! A spy may be near! On all office and administrative buildings, without exception, red-brown flags with swastikas are hung. There are many loudspeakers on the streets, from which mournful melodies can be heard. If in winter there were mainly brave marches broadcasted, now there are sad, mournful musical works of German composers. On the defence works are employed both Eastern workers and allied prisoners of war. Among them are many wounded, sick, exhausted. In the city, many refugees from East Germany, on cars, horses, bicycles and just on foot. With bags, bags, knots, bags, suitcases and backpacks, there were refugee nuns, tired, confused, frightened. There is little or no difference with our refugees in Ukraine in 1941. Among the passers-by, there are many disabled people walking with crutches, riding in wheelchairs, 
sitting near their homes. The picture is depressing, but I still do not hide the fact that there was some joy that the war came here, where it started. The names of the streets were also memorable. In the names, only the names of military and statesmen, Friedrichstrasse, Moltkestrasse, Königstrasse, Bismarckstrasse, Hitlerstrasse, Geringstrasse. There was not a single name of a scientist, poet, composer. That last time I went out into the city was both joyful and anxious at the same time. On the way back, I picked up a German magazine on the road. The guard didn't mind. I don't remember its title, but the content is etched in my memory. The magazine was divided into two parts by its content and headings. The title read, What We Had Before and After Versailles. Before the Peace of Versailles, the Germans had cavalry, infantry, artillery, etc. Pictures of these branches of the military are posted. After Versailles, Germany had nothing. The magazine photos show broken cavalry, mutilated equipment and cannons, dead soldiers lying around. It is concluded that it is impossible to go to the conclusion of peace. It is necessary to fight to the victorious end, to the last soldier. Goebbels' propaganda used such propaganda techniques. Although the German abuse of prisoners of war stopped at the end of the war, I mean the work camps, their Nazi education made itself felt at every step. Several times I had to observe the following picture. When a convoyer took a prisoner into the service barracks, for example, for bandaging, often the paramedic would eat lunch at his table. Often he would throw a piece of bread to the prisoner. Not served, but threw it. Like a dog. Like a dog. And the field officer did it without malice, as a matter of course. He was a Russian, not a German, not an Aryan. He won't leave his compatriot like that. And the field feeble himself and many soldiers used to say to Russian prisoners, Schweine rein, pig. Again it was often said without malice, in the order of things. Germans during the period of fascism were systematically indoctrinated from year to year. You are smarter than everyone else, better than everyone else, more cultured than everyone else. In this way, the soul of the German common man was gradually corrupted. I was very eager to know the situation outside the camp, so one day I asked the commandant to allow me to leave the camp with the prisoners of my barracks and work with them in the city. He wouldn't let me. In the morning I went to the camp gate to ask the field officer to do the same. I approached and heard the words of the field officer to the escort. Officer, we'll run away. Again, refusal. Another prisoner fell ill, prolonged gastrointestinal disorder. He asks for help, but not to be sent to Stalag. This time the field officer warned me in the presence of the interpreter and the escort to convince the German doctor of the necessity of sending the sick man. I declare, Mr. Fieldfable, it does not depend on me, but on the condition of the patient and the decision of your doctor. He looked at me angrily, but said nothing. The sick man was taken to the garrison sanitary unit in the city. On the way, I thought over the situation. Maybe the doctor could be persuaded that the sick man had simple diarrhoea and it was premature to send him to the central camp. But what about me and the field officer? The old doctor easily agreed with my arguments. As we walked back, I thought to myself, well, hold on, Ivan, now you'll be thoroughly flogged. And indeed, as soon as the escort reported the results of the visit to the doctor, the Feldfeeble attacked me with the most selective language. I'm silent. In a week, the sick man began to recover noticeably. Also, in the beginning of April, all prisoners were announced that on that day work was cancelled. We were taken out of the barracks to a reproducer amplifier, which had just been hung up. We were to listen to a programme in Russian, we wondered what else Goebbels' propaganda had prepared. Even from work we were released. At first only crackling and noise was heard from the loudspeaker. Then we heard Russian speech. We heard it and were surprised. It was broadcast from Prague. It was not said whether it was live or recorded. The Committee for the Liberation of the Peoples of Russia, Connor, headed by General Vlasov, has been formed which will continue the fight against Bolshevism together with the valiant German troops, the radio was broadcasting. 
Then they broadcast the speech of traitor number two, Zelenkov. The whole program lasted about an hour and a half. If you didn't want to, you had to stand there and listen. They had formed a living corpse in Prague. That was the opinion of all prisoners of war. At the same time, we were extremely concerned that this committee might go for a forced mobilization among Soviet POWs. In these last days for themselves, both the Germans and the Vlasovites could go for anything. This thought was so strongly and deeply embedded in the minds of many prisoners that we could not sleep that night. We talked in our barracks until morning. Where is the way out? The only way out is to escape. By any ways and means, escape. Since the prisoners worked in different teams and on different jobs, two of them promised to get and discreetly bring small metal scissors to the barracks. The prisoners were not always searched when passing through the camp gate. The next day, the scissors were in the camp barracks. The next day, another piece of news added fuel to our agitated minds. This news travelled all over the camp, and no one could say anything about where it came from. We were supposedly going to be evacuated by the Germans to the west, toward the advancing American troops. At that time, the Americans were probably closer to Potsdam than our troops. By evening, the prisoners of our barracks were divided on the question of whether to wait for evacuation to the west or to escape immediately. I began to persuade her that escape was in every way the best option for us. Some suggested that we wait in the camp for our own men. They would come and free us, they said. Ten people agreed with me. The rest disagreed or hesitated. About twenty people took part in the discussion of the escape. We began to work out the escape plan in detail. We had scissors. We all knew that there was no electric current through the barbed wire fence of the camp, and it could be cut freely. The sun was slipping towards sunset, and three elderly Germans with carbines came to the post, to the tower. There were no dogs. I began again to convince my comrades of the expediency of escape. One asked, what if the guards run after us? They would not, they would not leave the camp unguarded. We planned the first point of escape to a small city bathhouse, which was located a little away from the city. In this bathhouse, prisoners of war were washed once a month, then to the farm, to the bower's shed, where the prisoners often worked. We'll hide there. All in all, we had to overcome about three kilometres. The tension among us was heated to the limit. The whole camp was buzzing because it was not possible to hide the supposed escape of some of the prisoners. The time is twenty hours. Two with scissors began to crawl up to the barbed wire. We surrounded them in a semicircle so that their work would not be visible to the convoyers. We did not find ourselves in a place. We were worried about the thought that if the escape did not take place, we might be evacuated to the west. Then we would end up with the Americans or the British and there we could be detained for many weeks. The goal of the escape was one, to get to our own people and take part in the final stage of the war. On this day, April 21st, 1945, in the summary Sovinform Bureau reported, the troops of the First Belarusian Front have engaged in fighting in the northern and northeastern suburbs of Berlin and have begun to force the Oder River. The 3rd and 4th Guards tank armies of the 1st Ukrainian Front stormed the southern outskirts of Berlin and reached the southern approaches to Potsdam. In a minute, two rows of barbed wire were cut. We crawled into the resulting passage. All ten men crawled out safely. The rest of the prisoners of war did not take the risk and did not have time. Having run away from the camp for 20-30 metres, they heard the convoyer's warning shouts, Tsuriuk! Tsuriuk! Back! Back! Out of breath, we continued running. We heard shots from carbines. We reached the bathhouse and took cover behind the wall. We are breathing so hard that it seems that our heart is about to jump out of our chest. Not so much from fatigue as from nervous tension. As we suppose, there is no pursuit after us. Having breathed a little at the bathhouse, we began to think about how to move on to the farm. I was not sure that the Bauer would shelter us until the arrival of the Red Army units, and that they would be here any minute now, none of us doubted. 
we could already hear the artillery cannonade. He might hide us or he might report us to the nearest police station or the Gestapo. Everyone agreed with my doubts. So it was decided late at night to approach his barn unnoticed and hide in it until morning in the straw, so that no inhabitant of the farm would notice it. It should be noted that the escape plan was prepared hastily and ill-considered. The success of the escape was due not so much to a well-developed plan as to a favourable coincidence of circumstances. Next we had to pass the outskirts of Potsdam and there were two kilometres to the farm. Since I had never travelled this road, I was not allowed to go to the farm for work, I asked my comrades if there might be German soldiers on the way. They answered that there were German soldiers on the outskirts of the city, but never in the farm. It was decided to march through the town in formation, and if a patrol stopped us, to say that we were going to the farm to work. But there were no German guards or patrols with us. The plan failed, but we had no other way out. It was impossible to get to the farm without entering the town. We lined up two by two, and without hurrying, walked along the outermost street of Potsdam. The sun was almost over the horizon. We walked about 150, 200 metres. So far, everything is normal. Sometimes women, kids, old people pass by us. They don't pay any attention to us because Soviet prisoners of war often pass by here before. Suddenly, three German soldiers came out of the alley towards our small column, talking excitedly among themselves. I walked in the front row as I knew German and could answer questions if necessary. The soldiers approached us, glanced at us and continued on their way. Cold sweat broke out on my forehead. We passed another 100 metres. A non-commissioned officer and a soldier came towards us. They looked at us and also passed by. It's gone again. We have already cheered up a little thinking why the military did not stop us. What is it? The answer is one and very simple. The population and the military, for several years of the existence of the camp in the suburbs of the city, simply got tired of Soviet prisoners of war. Besides, every military man has his own task, and it is not customary in any army to meddle in his own affairs. And the prisoners go in formation, and Germans like Ordnung, order, in everything. We continue walking, we became cheerful, but it turned out that it was too early to celebrate the victory. Two SS men in black uniforms and with automatic rifles come out and argue about something. My comrades push me to the side. If they stop me, answer. As we approached, one of the SS raises his hand and gives a loud command. Halt! Stop! Wohin gehen? Where are you going? The column has stopped. I got a little out of line and I report in German. A column of Soviet prisoners of war from a work camp is going to a farm, I say the name of the farm, to do urgent work. Why no guards? The soldiers are all busy. Many of them have been sent to the front, I answer. The German thought about something for two to three seconds and commands, Weiter gehen, keep moving. After all these adventures, we finally left the city. I couldn't stand it and attacked my comrades. God damn it! I thought you said there was hardly any military. Don't swear, doctor. Yesterday there really weren't any. The sun went down over the horizon and it started to get dark. In about thirty minutes we reached the outskirts of the farm. In our opinion, it was a small village with two to three families. Comrades showed us a barn, and we entered it, going around the farm a little bit. It was completely dark inside. We spread straw and lay down on it. In the gap of the barn, despite the night, we could see the silhouettes of houses and other buildings of the farm. We breathed a little. We wanted to sleep, but nobody could sleep. Nervous tension was making itself felt. A long night passes in quiet conversations and thinking over further plans. Dawn has dawned. Through a gap in the barn, the fugitives noticed that our bower came out of the house and is coming towards us. Feverishly, we think of what to do in this situation. Although we are sitting in the straw, it is impossible to hide completely. The peasant opens the gate and sees us. He comes up to us. Except for me, he recognised everyone because he had been working as a prisoner for a long time. He asked why we were here and how we were here so early in the morning. 
I had to remember all my not particularly rich knowledge of German and answered him. We escaped from the camp. We asked to hide us until the arrival of our troops, and they will be here in a day or two. We'll see how he reacts to all this. Gut. Komen sie mit. Okay, come with me. What do we do? Where will he take us? To the farm, to his home, or maybe to the Gestapo, the police, or the local gendarmerie? We ask, where will you take us? To my home. Don't be afraid, I won't do anything bad to you. We decided to go because there was no other option. The villagers were still asleep, and we had the impression that the peasant had noticed us at night when we entered the barn. That's why he got up so early to check the contents of his barn. We walked a little way through the farm and entered a small wooden barn familiar to the prisoners, which was located on a small outskirts of the house. The prisoners often warmed up in this shed and, with the permission of the owner, cooked potato soup in the stove. They entered and closed the door behind them. Hitler has a bad head, said the peasant. He started a war against three great powers. We were silent. Then he said, I'll go home. You wait for me. I'll lock the door. Don't open the window or unlock it. Talk quietly. We sit and talk to each other in a half-whisper. We watch what's going on around us through the slits. Nervous tension doesn't subside. We don't know how the host will behave in the future. An hour passes, the second, the third. Suddenly from the corner of the cattle yard comes out our peasant together with a major and an armless non-commissioned officer. Instead of his left arm, he had a prosthesis, with a radio behind his back. They are walking and talking excitedly among themselves. We carefully follow their route. Now it was clear that all three of them were heading towards our shelter. We could not hear their conversation yet. It looked as if the Bauer had given us away and wanted to hand us over to the military authorities. Our nervous tension had reached a peak. How stupidly we'd gotten ourselves into this mess. We had no defence, not even a pitchfork. All three of them stopped a few steps away from our barn. The non-commissioned officer is tuning the radio off his shoulders. I've got my ears on as much as possible. Suddenly I hear the Major speaking to the peasant. Hans, you had Russian prisoners of war working for you. Where are they now? They're not here now. They're all in the camp. The Major's voice again. See to it. No more Russian prisoners of war here. The Soviet troops will come and they will torture the German citizens together. There are no prisoners on the farm, and there will be no more, replied the peasant. They stood a little longer and went away into the farm. I translated to my comrades the meaning of the conversation. We breathed a sigh of relief. In about an hour, our host returned to us. In one hand, propped under his side, he holds a large enamelled basin, in the other, under his arm, a weighty loaf of bread. He opens the door and says, I've butchered a calf, brought you the lungs, intestines and bread. There is firewood here. Heat the stove and boil your soup. We thanked him and started to work, especially as hunger was already making itself felt. But I asked him, Mr Bauer, what kind of military men were here recently? They were trying to determine the distance to the front line by the sounds of artillery cannonade with the help of a radio. He locked us up again and left. We made ourselves some soup, ate and calmed down a bit. Now, having acted in this way, the peasant was unlikely to betray us. Twilight came, the owner comes in again and says that we will spend the night in the same place and leaves. We talk among ourselves in a low voice. We don't light the fire. It's the second night we haven't slept. Early in the morning, the peasant invites us to come with him. We are again wary, but we go. He takes us into the basement of his strong brick house. In the basement, there are a lot of mattresses, blankets, pillows. He warned us to stay here and not to go anywhere. In the meantime, the rumbling of the cannonade was increasing, indicating that the front was approaching. In the evening, a German girl, the daughter of the owner, came in and brought some bread for everyone. To this day, I do not quite understand the true motives behind the behaviour of the German peasant who hid a group of Soviet prisoners of war. Why did he risk his behaviour? 
I think that his goals were good, and for that I thank him very much. The second and then the third night passed. Again we hardly slept again. It was pointless to go out and go somewhere. It was unknown where our own people were and where the Germans were. For some reason the owners don't come into the cellar anymore. To be on the safe side, we put a duty officer near the front door, who was changed every thirty minutes. Early in the morning of April 25th or 26th, I can't remember exactly now, when dawn was barely breaking, the cellar door opened with a jerk, and we heard a loud question in German. Verist, yes. Who's here? Our duty officer instantly made out the form of a military man standing at the door, shouted joyfully, Guys! Ours! We hastily began to go out of the dark basement to the street. The military man, in the rank of petty officer, stood with a machine gun in a carelessly thrown cloak tent and a pilot's cap on his head. We continue to climb, and he is still holding the automatic rifle, watching our every move warily. Of course he noticed we were unarmed. We quickly surround him. Without lowering his weapon, he asked loudly and imperiously, Who are you? Excitedly, interrupting each other, we began to explain that we were prisoners of war who had escaped from the Potsdam camp for Soviet prisoners of war. The petty officer, still holding his automatic rifle, asked another question. Are there any Vlasovites among you? No, we are all from the same camp. We have known each other for a long time. Before that, we were also together in other camps. The petty officer immediately lowered the machine gun wiped the sweat from his forehead, took out two packs of cigarettes. Those who smoked took the cigarettes and smoked. He smoked with us. Freedom. We rejoice, laugh, ask questions. The petty officer, inhaling a cigarette, continued to answer our questions. You guys are just lucky. You got into the famous motor-mechanised battalion of Guards Major Titov, which is part of the tank corps of Hero of the Soviet Union. Guards Colonel Pushkarev. The cause is part of the 4th Guards Tank Army, commanded by Guards Colonel General of Tank Forces Lelyushenko. The army is part of the 1st Ukrainian Front under the command of Marshal of the Soviet Union Konev. Then he continued, I will now write a note to the brigade's Pomnokstab, and you will go to him. Stick to the right side, bullets whistle less there. They'll feed you, get your uniforms, and fight, guys. The war isn't over yet. First we went into the house to thank the peasant. But he's gone. He ran away or hid. He's afraid of something. We're walking in a column, bullets whistling from time to time. The front line is close. We have passed a kilometre and a half. More and more we meet our equipment. Cars, self-propelled vehicles, Katyusha, guns, tanks. The officer who met us read us a note and pointed out where to find the brigade headquarters. We approached two tents. A captain comes out of one of them. We give him the note. He reads it fluently. I'm the chief of staff of the brigade. Comrades, take a paper from the clerk and write letters to your relatives now, because you are considered missing in your homeland or buried long ago. The clerk will tell you the number of the field mail. I ordered the cook to come over. Feed everyone well, then take them to the intendant. They should be changed, because everything is worn out, ragged, tattered. They were fed and given uniforms. There was no limit to our joy. The same day we all wrote letters to our homeland. I wrote three letters at once, to my wife, mother and mother-in-law. Our first letters were still very brief. We are alive, healthy, we escaped from captivity, we are in our military units. In the evening all of us were introduced to the battalion command, to the battalion commander, Guards Major Titov and his deputy on political part, Guards Captain Lysenko. The senior clerk and the battalion's Nachashtaba also arrived. The latter began to ask who and in what units served and fought before the capture. I answered that I had fought as a military field officer in a squadron of the 161st Cavalry Regiment of the 1st Special Cavalry Corps. Do you remember the number of the order on awarding you the rank of military field officer? asked Nakshtaba. There was no order to award the rank. We were graduated from Kharkov Military Medical School early, saying that the order would come later, 
directly to the front in the army formations. Whether the order came later or not, I know nothing about it. The chief of staff looked at me and said, Since you do not know the order to award the rank, it is not even known whether there was such an order. We cannot immediately restore your military rank. Maybe it will be sorted out after the war. You are a literate man. I advise you to go to the communications platoon of the battalion. The soldiers will help you quickly learn simple techniques. I agree to join any unit, including the communications platoon, as you recommend. I answered him. All right, go ahead. So I found myself in the communications platoon. Petty Officer Babenko met me. Balaev, we enrol you in the Department of Telephonists. The soldiers will show you how and what to do. They gave me a carbine. Soldiers of the department met me and three other former prisoners well, fed me once again, then began to ask where I was from and where I was in captivity. Three came closer to me. One of them was a truck driver of the communications platoon and said, we were also in captivity. We were liberated by our troops in Poland. Now we are fighting. I quickly mastered the field telephone equipment and with the soldiers, wherever ordered, began to pull coils. The coil was deployed or rolled up very quickly. That was the requirement. The first two or three days were difficult. I had no skill. Physically, I was still weak, and the work was often carried out under the whistle of bullets. Gradually, I got involved in this military labour. Staying in captivity in German fascist camps was left behind like a nightmare. I was fed, as they say, to the brim, but I refrained from eating a lot of fat. Numbers 28 or 29. April, when our motor mechanised corps as part of the 4th Guards tank army with fighting entered the area of the city of Potsdam, had to observe a curious picture. Among us, in addition to our soldiers and officers, there were many Polish soldiers in their confederates. It turned out that one of the units of the Polish army, our ally, had also entered Potsdam. Potsdam was taken by our troops from the southwest, from the side of the town of Luckenwald. Separate fighting still occurred. We had to smoke the Germans out of cellars and attics. We had to face such methods of fighting on the part of the Germans. A Faustnik would fire a Faustpatron from around a corner, hide, and a few seconds later he would come out with a white rag in his hand. If we don't react, he repeats everything again. In one of the battles with enemy machine gunners and Faustniki, petty officer Babenko, firing a machine gun in the heat of battle, did not notice how from behind the corner of the building, SS man was preparing to shoot at him. It was noticed by Private Simonenko. Everything was decided by a fraction of a second. Simonenko gave his turn first. After the battle, the petty officer and his saviour drank a hundred grams of front. The city was depopulated, but the inhabitants cautiously, with fear, still began to appear, come out of houses and cellars. They need water, food. The city suffered little during the capture. A lot of magnificent mansions, palaces, public buildings. We went into one of the houses. It's clear from the furnishings that it was not a poor family. The owners ran away, and all the furnishings remained untouched. And suddenly it cut my eyes. In the living room there was a clearly Ukrainian rushnik, then women's Ukrainian outfits. In the next room hung paintings by Russian artists with such familiar landscapes. Apparently the owners had something to flee from. On April 30th I noticed that many of the streets and sidewalks of the city were literally littered with small leaflets. I picked up one of them. The text was in German. This leaflet, it became, was intended for the inhabitants of the city or for German troops. The leaflets were dropped from an airplane by ours or the Allies. I began to read and immediately realised that the text of the leaflet had a direct relation to the fate of Soviet and Allied prisoners of war still languishing in captivity. The meaning of the leaflet was as follows. The government of the Soviet Union, the United States of America, and Great Britain seriously warns all commandants of Allied POW camps, guards, Gestapo, SS, SA, SD, Gendarmerie, and others for the safety of all prisoners of war. Each of you is personally responsible for the fate of prisoners of war, Stalin Roosevelt Churchill. 
After the war, I was able to ascertain that this was a statement by the governments of the USSR, USA and UK on the responsibility of German camp commandants, etc., for the safety of Allied POWs in their custody, made on April 25, 1945. Such an authoritative statement by the Allied governments was as good a time as any. The Hitlerites, who had lost their common sense during the agony of fascism, could physically exterminate the surviving POWs. And this authoritative statement had positive results. It cooled the ardour of executioners and sadists. It would seem that the Nazi Reich was on the eve of its demise. But despite this, the enemy troops in Potsdam fiercely resisted. Many of our tanks were hit by Faust patrons. We had trophy Faust patrons, so platoon and squad commanders hastily taught the soldiers how to handle them. On April 30th, during a relative lull, the deputy commander for political part, Guards Captain Lysenko, gathered all of us, freed from captivity, in the basement of one of the buildings. In the past, he was the director of a seven-year school somewhere in Siberia. He briefly got acquainted with us, told us about the combat path of the battalion, brigade, corps, and the glorious 4th Guards tank army. In absentia, he introduced the commander, Guards Major Titov, the holder of seven battle orders and many medals. In the past, he was a military field officer, then commanded a platoon, a company and finally a motorised mechanised battalion. He was presented to the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Captain Lysenko further said, Since Poland, we have replenished our units and formations, mainly at the expense of liberated Soviet prisoners of war. The sick and severely weakened are immediately sent to hospitals. The rest are fed for a week and a half, trained and gradually put into combat. All of them, former prisoners of war, fight well with the Germans. Many of them have already been awarded battle orders and medals. In the first battles you also showed your best side. The praise cheered us up, gave us fresh strength, in the zone of our corps on May 1st, there was some calm. Allied prisoners of war freed by our troops began to move westward. Americans, Englishmen, Frenchmen, Belgians, Dutchmen. There were elderly people and women. They greeted us, smiling, shouting in their own language. All of them moved slowly, giving way to troops and various equipment. The ways of movement were different, on foot, pushing some baby carriages with belongings in front, on harnessed horses. There were also luxurious fancy carriages with some family crests. In front of each column there was a national flag. There were also our liberated civilians taken to Germany for forced labour, men, women, teenagers and even children. Some of them still had a white cloth patch with the word Ost. Many of our soldiers, especially Ukrainians, impatiently ask, where from? One hears the answers. Smolensk, Dnepropetrovsk, Minsk, Mogilev, Poltava, Vinitsa. One of the soldiers met his fellow countrywoman, both of them from the same farm. She laughs, hugs him and cries. Then the soldier ran to the car, came back and put in her hands a loaf of bread, a can of canned food, a piece of sausage. He writes down the number of the field post office on a piece of paper and gives it to her. Leaving, shouts, Write, be sure to write, don't forget. We surrounded the guardsmen and chorus, in one voice asked, Who? The bride. These were the circumstances under which the Poltava girl met her fiancé. Will they meet again? Will they stay alive? I hoped so. In all the streets, white cloths, towels, sheets, white rags of various sizes were hung out of the windows of the houses, signs of surrender. There were no such signs anywhere during the German advance deep into our territory in 1941, 1942, not even in the western Ukraine. There was some respite in our units. Many soldiers, including me, thought at the time, not quite understandable lull. We all knew that on other parts of the front there were still persistent bloody battles. Why did our corps, and maybe even the army, stopped? But not everything should know ordinary soldiers and the matter was as follows. 
On May 5th, in Prague, began an uprising of the population against the occupiers. At that moment, there were a lot of enemy troops on the territory of Czechoslovakia. It was a grouping of German Field Marshal Schirner, which had about 800,000 people. German fascist troops, which included many SS units, could suppress the uprising in Prague and brutally massacre the rebels, destroy historical cultural monuments, which were prepared in advance for destruction by the occupiers. The forces were clearly unequal. Therefore, the headquarters of the rebels appealed to the Allies by radio for help. The American troops at that moment were much closer to Prague than the Soviet troops. However, the Americans did not show any active actions. Then the Soviet Supreme Command gave the order to leave the area of Big Berlin and Potsdam, part of the forces of the First Ukrainian Front, and send them to liberate the capital of Czechoslovakia. On May 6th, the third and fourth tank armies of the first Ukrainian front were advanced to the initial positions. Our corps on the big wide ring highway while advancing to Prague met a huge pile of broken enemy equipment, mangled and burned tanks, self-propelled vehicles, guns, trucks and cars. All this graveyard of equipment stretched for four or five kilometres. A lot of enemy corpses in green and black uniforms were lying nearby. We asked the officer who approached us what kind of massacre was going on here. He replied, Here our troops defeated the army of General Wenk, who was trying to break through to the encircled Berlin. Corps of the Fourth Guards Tank army came to the highway leading to Prague, moving slowly with stops and where and with very high speed. The communications platoon, as well as all the motorised infantry, on cars. Columns of troops on the plain U-2 flew around the army commander, Colonel General D. D. Lelyushenko, giving orders on the radio. When he flew very close and low over the column of our brigade, we waved to him. Seeing this, he quickly waved his club at us. After his wounding, he was still walking with a club. Our way is covered by fighter planes, but a lot of enemy planes are still appearing. Ahead, we hear fighting. The column stops and disperses. A small group of Germans attacked our infirmary, which was in the tail of the column. The attack was repulsed, but the medics were moved to the middle of the moving troops, so it was safer. By the evening of May 6th, we took the town of Freiburg, having passed 65 kilometres during the day. By the end of May 7, we met a large column of German soldiers and officers, numbering three, four regiments. They were marching not far from our track, in a ravine, more or less observing the rows. One could feel that this military mass of people was being led by someone. No spontaneous movement was noticeable. Everyone is armed, but the muzzles of automatic rifles and carbines are lowered to the ground. They do not shoot. Having equalled, the columns stopped. Neither Germans nor ours did not take any action. The distance between us was no more than 50 metres. Battalion and brigade commanders were in some contemplation. What to do? What to do with the Germans? To take prisoners, and if they resist, to fight and destroy them. But in two, three minutes the order was received by radio. Not to get involved in the battle, to let the Germans into our rear. Apparently, this grouping of Germans will be dealt with by others. We continued to move forward to the borders of Czechoslovakia. By the end of May 7th, we crossed the Orr Mountains. All day long there were small battles and skirmishes with scattered groups of Germans. All day on May 8th we made a march. There were stops, several small battles. The columns passed through mountain passes, through numerous rivers and rivulets. In the middle of the day we received a verbal order from the political department of the front, which was reported by the battalion commissar. We are approaching the borders of Czechoslovakia, which is allied and friendly to us. The attitude to the citizens of the Republic must be especially polite and correct. There should be no misunderstandings with the population. In one of the farms, seven to eight young women came out to the road and started tearfully begging us to take them with us. They were Ukrainians who had been taken to Germany for agricultural work at the beginning of the war. Of course, they could be understood. For many years they had been away from their homeland, their relatives and friends, among strangers. They suffered humiliation and abuse, were often hungry, subjected to exhausting labour. 
They needed to get home and as soon as possible. But the regiment commander politely but categorically refused the women. We had other tasks, not related to the problems of civilians. In the next farm the same picture, and again the refusal. Our compatriots could not get to their native places on their own. Firstly, they had no documents. Secondly, they could not walk far, and they needed to feed on the road. But we had no right to take them with us. We still had battles ahead of us. We passed through a small town. The streets were narrow. The cars crept slowly along the houses. In one of the windows we saw a girl kneading dough in a kvashna. One of our communicators, twisting German words, tried to make contact with her. Guten Morgen, good morning, and so on. In response we heard the purest Russian language. Soldatic, don't strain yourself and don't break your tongue. I am Russian. Thunder of laughter all along the street. It turns out that she is from Smolensk, was taken to Germany by the Germans, and will soon go home. At first they took offence, but after the owners had three sons killed on the Eastern Front, they got quiet and treated her normally. At dusk the columns entered a forest area. Suddenly there was a stop, a big forest blockage. The road was blocked by a large number of trees cut down and piled across the road. The enemy hindered our advance in every possible way. It was urgent to dismantle the debris. We used saws, axes, all this was in every car. In thirty minutes we coped with the work. There were two more such debris along the way. They, of course, delayed the columns. There was a large column of German prisoners of war, accompanied by our machine gunners. In the column ahead went officers, then field officers, non-commissioned officers, and only then, soldiers. Many old men, teenagers, and very young men in green Wehrmacht uniforms, Volkssturm. Some are wounded, dirty, ragged, unshaven, and frightened. The lieutenant leading the column expresses dissatisfaction with the task assigned to him. He does not want to go to the rear of his battle comrades, and even in the last days of the war. The advance was so fast that the Germans abandoned their army field hospital. A white flag with a red cross was flying on a pole. The attendants scattered, many wounded, some needing urgent surgery. To the wounded approached an interpreter with a machine gunner. All Germans were announced that they were captured, asked to surrender all available weapons. In the hospital remained two machine gunners, a few of our medics, and we went on. At night from May 8 to May 9, the army entered the territory of Czechoslovakia. We passed villages and towns by car. Women, children shouting, Nazda, take Prague! At 2 a.m. on May 9, the 4th Tank Army from the northwest came close to the suburbs of the capital of Czechoslovakia. A small stop. Dawn was coming. Around 3 a.m. on May 9, our army with the 3rd Tank Army of Colonel General P.S. Rybalko stormed the streets of Prague. Although the war was over on May 8th, on May 9th, until about 10 o'clock in the afternoon, fierce fighting took place in the city, sweeping from enemy soldiers' blocks and streets. Prague citizens met our troops in a rare, friendly and joyful manner. Along the streets, an abundance of people. Tanks and cars were pelted with flowers, greeted by raised hands and shouts, Nazda, Nazda. During small stops, the citizens of Prague invite us into their apartments, houses, treat us to wine and food. The host and hostess and we raise our glasses. The host proclaims, Stalin, we reply, Benes. The Prague women kiss the soldiers in a burst of emotion. Flags are hung out of the windows, Red Soviet, most of them, American, English, Czech and Slovak flags. From time to time, columns of German prisoners of war soldiers and officers pass under the escort of our soldiers and sometimes of the rebellious population. The townspeople meet them with shouts of indignation. Near the railroad station, an echelon is being prepared for the shipment of fresh prisoners. They are fed at the carriages from field kitchens. With a large ladle, a German is distributing food into the woks of the approaching prisoners, Next to him, our soldier Automachnik closely follows the distribution. 
Sometimes the machine gunner orders, Zwei Portion. The German on the distribution responds, Ja wohl, and pours two scoops. We approach the kitchen and ask, Why such inequality? Who gets one ladler and who gets two? This wounded man has lost a lot of blood. We need to feed him. And that one over there is too skinny and a teenager. We should pour more too. You can't understand the Russian soul. Just when they were enemies, but now they feel sorry for them. After ten o'clock in the afternoon, there was silence. Unusual silence. I could not believe that the war was over, but until the late evening, the troops and residents were on the streets of Prague and celebrated Victory Day. In the evening of May 9th, the personnel of our corps was withdrawn from Prague for several kilometres to some forest area. We unfolded tents, the everyday peaceful army life began. In two or three days, we received the first letters from our relatives. I was lucky. I received three triangles at once from my wife, mother and mother-in-law. The first letters in three years. I opened each one with trepidation. What is it? How is it? Is everyone alive and well? My wife writes that my daughter Lida is growing up. We survived four hard war years. It was hungry and cold, but now everything is fine, she reassures me. They are waiting to go home, because demobilisation should be soon. Fresh issues of newspapers were regularly delivered to the tents. Krasnaya Zvezda, Pravda, Izvestia and others. Greedily read all the news. Army everyday life consisted of morning exercises, rifle training, communications training, political training, dead hour, lunch and dinner. Wartime movies were often shown in the evenings. Once the newspapers reported that the bodies of Goebbels, his wife Magda and six children who had been poisoned, were found in Berlin. On May 2nd, 1945, in the centre of Berlin, in the bomb shelter building of the Reich Chancellery, at 5pm, the charred corpses of a man and a woman were found, with the corpse of a man of short stature, the foot of his right leg in a half-bent state, stubby, with a burnt metal prosthesis. He was carried out into Berlin Street. The Nazi uniform, dark woolen pants and a light brown tunic, all in shreds, in rusty traces of fire. The wind rubs his yellow tie, a yellow silk loop around his black charred neck. Before he died, Goebbels destroyed six of his own children. The circle of murder was closed. Poison fire were the means tested in the concentration camps. 24. I saw Goebbels' propaganda in action. The devastated lands of Ukraine, the death camps, the ditches with tortured people, the mockery and trials of constant starvation, the terrible hatred of the Russian people and their customs. But I saw Goebbels himself, and it was under the following circumstances. In the second half of April 1945, in the afternoon in the Potsdam camp announced an air alert. In such cases, we were driven into dug trenches. There was no air raid, and in 2030 minutes, everyone began to disperse to the barracks. I, as a military field officer, was called to the commandant's barracks. There it was necessary to render a little medical aid to a German soldier who had injured his finger. I went to the entrance gate of the camp. At the same time, two passenger cars entered the territory. In the second was a guard, and from the first car came out, limping, a thin, short man in a civilian suit. How do you guard prisoners of war? he asked the guard. He reported to the guest about the security system. I was standing next to him. Reinforce the guards and do your duties properly. If you escape, you will be shot. The Russians may come soon and there'll be trouble. The cars turned around and drove off. I asked the dazed German. Who was that? Reichsminister Dr Goebbels. His death was less than two weeks away. It was a pity we couldn't capture him alive. On May 11th, some of the servicemen who took part in the liberation of Prague received certificates of appreciation which expresses the gratitude of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. I still have it, and it is dear to me because it was the first award I received after escaping from captivity.